Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council, navigating the human experience together. Hafadeh, Thiro, and welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry, and today we are continuing our series on stories, legends, and folk tales, giving us a glimpse into many of the different cultures that make up our Marianas community. And today I'm excited to be learning about the country of Peru with my friend, Mili Saiki. Mili, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Man, it's interesting because you've lived here 30 years, uh, given so much to the community, and I'm really grateful that we're able to share a little bit about your country and your way of life today. So thank you for your time. My pleasure. Uh, most people, when they think of Peru, right, they think of Machu Picchu. Um, but maybe you could start us off with something about the Incas or... Sure, Peru. Uh, everybody knows the country because Machu Picchu has become an amazing place to visit. But Peru is much more than Machu Picchu. And um, we study about the Incas at the young age, but how much we really know about the Inca culture and how has been affected through the changes of uh, life. So I was thinking to share with you uh, the legend of the, how the Inca Empire was founded. So, I don't know, you think it's in, it will be good? Yes, please. <laughs> well, um, the Inti God, which is the sun, wants to help the earth to become a more beautiful place. So, it sent his um, children, which was Manco Capac and Mama Oclio. Manco Capac was going to be the prince and Mama Oclio the princess. So, when they came here, they came from the Titicaca Lake which it is um, one of the few freshwater lakes in the world. I which think is I've heard of it. 300, uh, they said it's more than 300 million years of, um, it's very old. Yeah. And right now it's, um, it's very interesting and we will talk about later why the Titicaca is important, but the legend says that Manco Capac and Mama Olio came out from the Titicaca Lake and um, the father, the son, gave them this little stick of gold and told Manco Capa that he has to put the stick on the soil until the stick went all the way in. Okay. And that means um, that's when the empire, it will be founded. So that's what they did. And the legend said that they walked for many, many days until they arrived to Cusco, where it's the Inca city, and that's when they found the Inca empire, and that's when everything starts. Hmm. When you hear this story, do you relate to it in any way, like the gold or the lake being significant? Well, um, a lot of festivities are around the Inti, which is the gold sun, and Peru has a lot of gold and silver. So in a way, yes. And um, the Titicaca Lake has a, a floating islands that they are made by a grass called Ichu. And the natives put layers of this grass year after year, and that's where they live. And they don't, in the past, they didn't leave the, the Titicaca Lake. They stay there, they fish, so they eat fish. and. Um, they didn't have power, they didn't have... Internet. Uh, and, oh, no. <laughs> and once a, a, a week, on Fridays, they will go to the city and exchange the fish for whatever other food they wanted. But now we have solar panels, so now they have sun, uh, they have power, and it has become very touristic, so they have even small rooms that tourists can rent, but the majority of the traditions are staying there. 
Now, they send the children to the city for education, but a lot of them will return to the floating islands to live and get married. So it's, um, it's very interesting. It's one of the most um, touristic attraction because it's totally different. Yeah. yeah. How, about how many people are living on these floating islands? Uh, last time we went, there were, uh, I think, 27 islands, and they are different communities, and they are like a tribes. Every family has his own um, uh, island. island, and I believe between 27 and 30, I believe. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, do you see, well, one of the things you do living here is you take a group of young people from the school where you work to Peru on a trip, uh, which is great that they get to go with you being from there. Do you see any parallels between, or do they see parallels between life and culture in Peru and their lives here in the Marianas, you think? Um, so many times they said, oh, this is like over here, especially the name of the food. We have bunuelos, they are different, but the name is igual, and uh, same, we have estofado, um, some of the dessert mm. may be similar, um, and the influence of Spanish in our culture is there, definitely is there. Mm -hmm. To what extent does the, is Spanish culture um, a part of Peruvian culture, and is there still a strong Native American um, presence? Um, in the Peruvian Andes, the, the cultures are still very strong. And there is the Quechuas and the Aymaras, they even speak a different language. And they are very proud of being natives. And unfortunately, as in a different cultures, they are discriminated mm. because they don't speak Spanish properly. Um, they don't look Spanish or mestizos, they are, um, they are a little darker in the skin and, and the factions are much more pronounced. And when I talk to my tourist guy, when I go and bring my students, most of the time they'll, they'll complain because sometimes they will bring um, employees from the capital instead of hire them because they don't look mm -hmm. um, as white as other cultures. But um, they are very rich in cultures, and I really like when I talk to them because they are maintaining the traditions, and um, I'm very proud mm -hmm. of those traditions. And I always tease my family, and I said, I think in my other life, I might have been from here because <laughs> I just smell the food that they cook with wood or stones, and I just want to dance. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So looking back to when you were a little girl, is there a particular story that stands out to you like this is a very popular children's story or your favorite children's story, anything like that? Um, you know, like uh, we have the, the All Saints uh, festivity here that when um, we have similar, we don't go to the cemetery, mm -hmm. but um, November 1st, it is a it's holiday, it's a big celebration. So on October 31st, before Halloween becomes so important around the world too, um, families or companies will uh, get together and then we'll have a cake in the shape of a baby. Wow, okay. And, but not with legs and arms, it's more like this. Okay. And the company will name the godfather, the godmother, the parents, and the baby has a symbolic meaning. Like I used to do it with my students here, and we will choose that the symbolic meaning of the baby will be the future. So each one of them have to wish the baby something for the future. And then you have a glass of champagne, and the godfather has to throw money, and the money is for real money, coins. Who gets the money? The guest. Okay. <laughs> Most of the time will be only the children. So children will, will wait for the godfather to finish the champagne, cut the baby, and then throw the, the, the money, which is called sebo. And the kids will start, sebo, padrino, sebo, padrino. And all the kids are running for the money. And you can go to the bakery and they will have a small, it's called guagua. The baby in yeah. Quechua word it means baby. Okay. So they will have the guaguas and it's like a sweet bread, 
like a sweet bread you can buy here, the chamorro bread. Mm -hmm. That is exactly what it is. But it has like a little face of a baby. Oh, okay. Yeah, something fun. That must have been like one of the favorite holidays of the kids, right, was this holiday. What's it called again? Um, we will call the Bautizo de la Guagua. Yeah, oh. the, the christening of the baby. Oh, okay, baptism yes. of the baby. The baptism oh, of the baby, okay. yes. So we were chatting before the show, and you were saying that there's actually a lot of um, stories related to different holidays, mm -hmm. either religious or otherwise. Could you give us another example? Yeah, when the Spanish came to Peru, and actually to South America, they wanted to impose the faith, the religion. Mm -hmm. So if you go to South America, you are going to see that there's a lot of churches like in my city, which is Arequipa, we have seven churches downtown. We are telling you about 12 blocks of construction, and we have seven churches. And usually these churches were built under, um, there was Inca Palace, they will destroy it, and they build the church on the top to impose the religion. And obviously when the Spanish people came, at the beginning they didn't mix with the Peruvian natives. But little by little, it happens, you mm -hmm. know? So there is a lot of mestizos, and they start converting into the um, uh, uh, Catholic faith. But then the, the celebrations start also mixing. And a great example is um, the Corpus Christi is one of the biggest um, Catholic uh, um, holidays, and is celebrated in Cusco. And I think it's 51 days after um, Eastern, I believe. And so they have four virgins, Virgin Marys, that they have different names. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, I think they have the that Catholic, here, too. You have, yeah. The Merciful or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Uh, and you have Santa I could be wrong. Maria, Santa Ana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have also the saint, like a San Agustin, San Antonio. So they choose, I believe there are seven saints and four virgins, and they get out from every church because they have different churches, and they are going to walk from the church all the way to the cathedral. Okay. That takes eight, eight days. Every night is one procession. So the bishop will be there, some personalities will be there around the virgin going into the cathedral or Question. the Question. So is this like a statue? The statue. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's the okay. statue. But behind the statue, you will see a lot of people from that with church. music. Oh. Dancing and drinking. So you see the faith in the front <laughs> <laughs> and the diversion and, and the fun in the back. So it's when I say the, the folklore mixed with the faith and okay. it's just fantastic. No? Okay. And it lasts for eight days, and after that, the city is absolutely <laughs> um, tired because all these festivities and dancing, and it comes with a lot of food, a lot of drinks, and but it's really amazing. When I go with my students, we sometimes we have uh, we are lucky enough to see the last day. Yeah, I I don't bring them there because it's a little busy, and I always a little worried, you know, safety. But last time we went in 2023, um, we saw the last part with a lot of dance. We even danced with them a little. Yeah, yeah. And then at the same time, that is celebrating the Inti Raimi, that is the beginning of the solstice of winter. And in Sacsayhuaman, which is the biggest ruin, one of the biggest ruins in Cusco from the Inca times, people come from all over the Andes to make the celebration and is to pay tribute to the sun, the God's son. And they sacrifice um, a llama and again, it's a lot of dancing and celebration. But you see, one is with the faith and the Catholicism and the other one is just with the Inca traditions. Mm. But are in the same, kind of the same day. Is there is there a conflict between people who are more into the Catholic slash Spanish faith and or more into the no, it all no, just kind of mixes no, together. It's just different different ways to celebrate. Like okay. I, um Holy Week. 
you have the very serious traditions with going to church, receive the communion, having a procession, but there's a lot of food also involved. And a couple of days before or after, like now is Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, is the beginning of the carnival in South America when you are going to hear uh, the biggest Rio de Janeiro carnival. Mm -hmm. um, in my city is a huge uh, celebration too. Okay. And one of the biggest celebration comes in the highest part of the Andes where um, more than, I don't know, maybe 5,000 people will come from all over the, the uh, place to just dance for La Virgen de la Candelaria, another virgin mm -hmm. that comes from the Spanish time and is the day of the Can Candelaria Virgin and people will just dance with these traditional dances and, and customs and different food and drinks and it's, it's really impressive. But even though it's maintaining the, the culture of being an Inca or Quechua, it is around the festivities that they were brought by the Spanish people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. Well, it, it kind of sounds like Peru might be a good place to go and like celebrate anything. <laughs> yes, it doesn't matter when you go. Are there it's a lot of these holidays? Oh, yeah, yes. absolutely. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, if you go these months are the summer and it's amazing, you know, because uh, we have more than 200 miles of beach. So wow. uh, you can choose wherever you go and it's great. But if you go during the winter, there's always one celebration that you will be like, wow, this is great. And uh, as was uh, telling you before, the Peruvian food has become something very famous and popular. So it's worth it. Mm -hmm. We're chatting today with Millie Saiki of uh, Peru, telling stories, and we'll be back with more after this break. Half a day, Zantiro. I'm Leo Pangilinan with the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. We'd like to take a moment to thank our generous sponsors who have made possible the many programs in our community like this show. We couldn't have done it without them. And if you value the work we do and would like to make a contribution to our efforts, we ask that you consider making an in-kind or cash contribution to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Any amount is appreciated, and donations of up to $5,000 qualify for an educational tax credit. We appreciate your partnership and support. Sizus maasi, olomai, and thank you. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. We are continuing our series, Stories, Legends, and Folk Tales, talking with Millie Saiki from Peru. Millie, we were talking about one of my favorite subjects, food, mm -hmm. right before we went to the break. Uh, you mentioned earlier the wawa, the cake shaped like a baby. Do you have any other stories related to food? Yes. Um, Peru has a big influence from people from Macau. 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 How is when, that? When the, the slaves got freedom, um, people in Peru who has these big farms lost the workers. And so Peru has a lot of sugar cane and cotton. And somebody has the great idea to go to Macau and bring workers. And they told them, you know, Peru is very rich in gold. Peruvians don't know the value of gold, you will become very rich soon, which it wasn't actually. Peruvians knew the value of gold. Yes. But there were a lot of um, uh, people from Macau to go to Peru and stay in the coast. Okay. So they influenced the Peruvian food. And if you go to Peru, you are going to find a lot of restaurants which are called chifa. Chifa. Chifa, which means just Chinese food. And that has fusion with the Peruvian mm. food. And now we have a dish that is called lomo saltado, which is very, very popular. And it's just meat with onions and tomatoes. It's, what kind of meat? Um, they have to be a tender meat. Okay. And when I invite people to my house here for dinner, it's something that everybody loves it. Ask me how I made it. And it's a very simple dish, but 
It's very popular. And I'm a good cook, too. Oh. Yes. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I might have to test you on yeah, that. I no. think, uh, yeah, I think, yeah. I will write it down. <laughs> so you can see a lot of dishes that are coming for the influence of the Chinese I see. Um, community. But also Peru has the second largest um, Japanese um, community. That's right. There are a lot of yeah, people in The first in one Peru is in Brazil. The second lessons. one uh, came to Peru during uh, and after the war, too. Actually, my husband, father was Japanese. I see. So, uh, and that has brought a lot of fusion food with one of those are the ceviche. And the ceviche in Peru, it's a little different than in other cultures because Peruvian, um, we have a very special lemon, which is very, very citric. And that's what makes the Peruvian ceviche very, very peculiar and special. Mm. And it's the raw fish that is cooked in the lemon. Mm -hmm and has become also very famous. And from that, a lot of um, Japanese chef has started mixing and, you know, from whatever you see as sashimi, now it's called tiradito, but they have a lot of different spices that we use. And so each one of them has become very, very different and it have this unique f flavor. And of course, we have the traditional food with quinoa that a couple of years ago become very popular around the world which Peruvians, we weren't very happy because we were buying it for, I don't know, maybe $2 per pound, and then suddenly went to a $18 per Whoa. pound because quinoa got very popular yes, that's and true. everything was exporting. Mm. But um, It's very nutritious, quinoa. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we have three very strong mark um, places in Peru, the coast, the Andes, and the jungle with mm -hmm. the Amazon. So. Mm -hmm. Foods are different for whatever region you are going, but each one of them has a very special dish or place and um, has become very famous around the world. Something to look for when we travel off island, some oh, Peruvian food. Absolutely. I think Peruvia has become, if it's not the first, it's the second or third destination just for food. Mm. And last year, the Peruvian um, restaurant in Lima was elected the best restaurant in the world. Oh, okay. I don't remember the name and that's bad, but um, yeah, it was, um, everybody was so proud of it that forget if you want to go to that restaurant. I think reservations are all the way to the 2025 wow. because it has become very famous. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the other very well-known things about Peru, other than the new fad of uh, the, the cuisine or culinary aspect is this little fellow here that you brought yes yes the llama. i have to ask you first though when you when you handed him to me or when i picked him up you said not to keep yes just to <laughs> for the show yes is he special to you well it is it is special because um despite of what people think we have these animals come from the family of the camels but it's not only one kind, we have four. And so the one that has become very popular, the llamas, which in English is llamas, and the llamas are used more for transportation. And then the cousin is the alpaca, which the head of this animal is the alpaca, and you can see this it's is very the, soft. This is an alpaca. Oh, so this, this is, is actual is, real alpaca oh, here? Oh yeah, this is a real alpaca. Yes. I didn't realize, but now that you mention it, it does feel different from yeah. a normal stuffed yeah, animal. Yeah, it is a real alpaca, and they they have alpaca and baby alpaca. This is alpaca. Baby alpaca, obvio, is much um, expensive. And then, llamas and alpacas can be domesticated. You can you can have it okay. in your garden or in the farms. But we have another ones that are called vicuña, and vicuña are wild and they are just in the Andes, um, they are free. And I will tell you something very interesting about them. And there is another one that is called Guanaco that is, I think, in, in, in extinction right now. I think there are only oh, 50 wow. because the conditions of the weather have changed. And so when do they, they do they use the hair of those? The, what's the last one called? Guanaco. No, they're very, no, very wild. Because they're so endangered. Yeah. Yeah. And the vicuña is very um, special because you can shave them only once a year. And they, um, the produce become very expensive. Mm -hmm. 
and it's light, but if you wrap yourself in something from Vicuña, you are protected from, from the coldness. It's amazing, mm. yes. And when the Spanish people came to South America, they brought dogs, they brought horses, and then people who um, were taking care of the alpacas and the vicuñas, they were afraid of they were going to start killing them. So they took it high in the mountains, in the Andes. The wow. conditions are really, really difficult. Number one, you are over, uh, I don't know, almost to 7,000 meters, that's like 18,000 feet. There is no water, there is no power. Um, practically nothing grows there. So, but these um, farmers have been um, protecting these animals and they still are. And so uh, the companies who now process the alpaca fiber, they also protect a lot of the natives that take care of these animals because the conditions where they live are, are very, very hard. Extreme. You know? Of course, now power is a little more um, affordable with the solar, but food and water is still very challenging. So that's why um, this, which we call our Kennedy, our Kennedy's are very proud for people in South America. Mm. Yeah. Do you have any particular legends or um, things that you learn about the alpaca or the llama? Um, well, um, I wouldn't say a legend, but you know that uh, they are friendly animals, but if they don't like you, they spit on you. I think <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah, and they can also <laughs> kick at you. And so people respect them. They are very cute, but they don't like to be bothered. No. Oh, yeah, this sounds like yeah. a camel actually also, right? Camels yeah. can get a little bit mean if they don't like yeah. you. And when you, <laughs> we, um, I take my students to an alpaca farm where they can see there are like a six or different kinds of alpaca, ones with short hair, another one with long hair. And the amazing thing is when they shave the them head of the animal, the native families comes, the women come with the children, they sit on the floor and they start touching the, the head and they start separating it. So you don't see much difference when you see them, if you observe them for 10 minutes, but then they will explain to you, this is a first quality, this is a second quality, this is no good. They're experts. Experts. From but the touch. Everything is by hand and they, they pass this from mother to daughters for generation for generation. So the companies really protect the families because they don't want this tradition to, to disappear because, you know, the modern world, kids want to go to study. They, want, they don't want to live in, in, up in the Andes anymore. They want to go to the cities. But somehow they are still protecting this tradition and um, they do everything by hand until it's washed and then it goes to the machines to create the tops. You know? mm. yeah. That's so touching because it makes me think of the indigenous cultures here and how the knowledge is passed in a very similar way, generation to generation yeah. working together. That's how it's passed on. Yes. So beautiful. Yes. Millie, thank you so much for sharing today. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we go? Well, if um, any family from Saipan is thinking to go to South America and visit Peru, please don't hesitate to call me. I will be more than happy to be your tour or maybe give you some guidance and where to go, when to go. And yeah, I'm very excited. It sounds like a lot of fun. It is. The best days to go to eat, uh, part, do some of that uh, religious partying. <laughs> if you want to see the religion party, you go in June. If you want to dance a lot and drink a lot, you go now during the summer. <laughs> Thank you, Millie. You're welcome. It has been a pleasure. All right. Our guest today has been Millie Psyche of uh, our Marianas community sharing about uh, Peru in this series, Stories, Legends, and Folk Tales. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry.
Your Humanities Half Hour has been made possible in part by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Democracy demands wisdom. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. For more information or to share your thoughts, contact the Northern Marianas Humanities Council at nmhcouncil.org or on social media at 670 Humanities, that's 670 Humanities.